Thank you for the very nice introduction and for the invitation to be here. It's good to see old friends and to make new friends. Um, I didn't plan um, my talk in relation to Martin's, but um, this is my first slide. Um, and I think, you know, normally I start my talks with the patient, but I think it's better to start the talk with the success story. So this is one of my heroes. I, when I'm not working, I play the cello for fun. And Pablo Casals was a great Spanish cellist. In fact, uh, he's one of the greatest cellists and musicians of all time. Um, and he's my hero also because he was a great humanist. But he's on the slide um, because he was like uh, Martin's last, gentleman on Martin's last slide, in that he's a real example of successful aging. Um, he, he lived into his 90s. Um, he was active into his 90s, as you can see on the slide. Um, and in fact, he married for the second time in his early 80s to a woman who was 60 years younger than he was. Um, so so um, that type of longevity, healthy aging, is what I think we all aspire to. Um, so how are we going to get there? And today, I hope I'll be able to um, give you some of the hints of the types of strategies uh, my lab's been um, using to, to see if we can um, stave off some of the diseases that prevent healthy aging. I'm going to divide my talk into um, four sections, but really only into two parts. I mean, the first, I'm going to describe um, our older work relating autophagy to neurodegeneration, um, and then describe how this led us to search for new signaling pathways that regulate autophagy. Finally, I'm going to tell you about what I think is an important component, is that how we can link basic science related to the cell biology of autophagy to understanding disease pathogenesis. So how our basic science has given us insights um, into disease pathogenesis. Um, and then in the final part of the talk, I'm going to tell you something completely different to autophagy, which might also end up being um, a druggable pathway that we can exploit um, to stave off neurodegenerative diseases. So for this audience, I don't really need to rehearse the fact that most adult onset neurodegenerative diseases, and indeed childhood onset diseases like lysosomal storage diseases, are associated with the formation of I mean, inclusions or aggregates within the cytoplasm um, of neurons. And there's extensive genetic and transgenic evidence that suggests that these types of aggregate-prone proteins, particularly in Mendelian forms of these diseases, exert their pathogenesis through toxic gain-of-function mechanisms. So the strategies that we've been interested in over the years are either to find ways of enhancing the ability of cells to get rid of these types of poisonous proteins, just lowering the load of the poison for the cells, or alternatively, um, to find ways of helping those proteins fold so that they're not so aggregate prone. As the first part of the talk is about autophagy, let me just give you a, a quick tour through what autophagy really is. The first morphological character is characteristic feature of autophagy is this cup-shaped double membrane structure called a phagophore that um, forms more or less randomly in the cytoplasm of most cells. And um, as its edges um, expand and then fuse, it engulfs a portion of cytoplasm containing whatever happens to be in that cytoplasm. Um, these autophagosomes are then trafficked along microtubules to the microtubule organizing center of cells where the lysosomes are clustered. Um, and this enables the fusion of autophagosomes and lysosomes and the subsequent degradation of the autophagic contents by the lysomal hydrolases. About 12, 13 years ago, Brinda Ravi Kumar in my lab found that if one slowed the formation of autophagosomes or the fusions of the autophagosomes and lysosomes, one slowed the clearance of the oligomers or the aggregate precursors for mutant Huntington. And in doing so, it's increased the accumulation of these proteins, both in the soluble species and the aggregate species, and um, in conjunction, this enhanced cell death. And, and we showed this initially in cells, but subsequently um, in Drosophila and mouse models. But what's perhaps more interesting about our findings at the time was that if we enhanced the clearance um, of these proteins in cells by upregulating autophagy, um, we could ameliorate toxicity. 
either in cell models, neurons, drosophila or mouse um, models of Huntington's disease. And this was accompanied by decreased accumulation of the mutant proteins. The important point to make is that when we in initiated these studies, we used rapamycins because they were the only drugs we were aware of at the time that were predicted to induce autophagy and were used chronically in human conditions. We've expanded um, the list of diseases where there's potential autophagy upregulation to a wide number of neurodegenerative conditions. Um, as you all know, Huntington's disease is the most common of the 10 conditions caused by expanded polyglutamine tracts in the protein. And the second most common is a disease called spinocerebellar ataxia type 3, or Mercado Joseph disease. Um, and we showed in cell-based systems and in mouse models of this disease that the mutant protein is an autophagy substrate and that we could virtually normalize the phenotype in a mouse model of this disease even, after, even if we initiate the treatment after the initial appearance of signs. In addition to the, nine, the 10 polyglutamine diseases, there are nine diseases caused by abnormally long polyalanine tracts in the protein, and these proteins are also aggregate prone, and as a model system we showed in cells and in Drosophila models that such proteins were autophagy substrates and that there would be benefits to autophagy upregulation. But perhaps the most important diseases on the slide are are represented by those involving tau, where wild-type tau um, is believed to be a mediator of pathogenesis in Alzheimer's disease, and point mutations give you frontotemporal dimensions. And we showed um, that in cell-based systems that both wild-type and point mutants of tau are autophagy substrates, and that in Drosophila, we could ameliorate the phenotypes by upregulating autophagy. And finally, alpha-synuclein is the protein that accumulates in Parkinson's disease, and we showed that its clearance could be enhanced by autophagy upregulation. This idea has now caught on in the field, and many have now tested this concept in their favorite models. And this slide just gives you a hint of what's been going on in the field, um, and you're not supposed to read the details, but just see that there's been a lot of activity and validation of the key concept um, in rodent models of many of these diseases. So our spinocerebellar ataxia type 3 data have been replicated. There are data in Alzheimer's disease, tauopathies, Parkinson's disease with alpha synuclein overexpression, ALS or FTD with TDP43 mutations, and even in a familial prion uh, mutation in mice. There is a health warning on the slide, though. So although the concept might appear that autophagy might be able to solve all these diseases. I don't believe it's the case. I think autophagy upregulation might be a viable therapeutic strategy where you've got a condition caused by an aggregate prone protein, but where autophagy flux is not impaired. And by that I mean that there's not any delayed traffic of the autophagosomes to the lysosomes, because if that were to occur, so if autophagies aren't, remo autophagosomes aren't properly removed by lysosomes, then upregulating autophagy is just going to lead to an accumulation of autophagosomes, and that might be unproductive or even toxic. So I think the message is um, before thinking about treating a disease with autophagy upregulation, one really needs to understand the biology of the system in the relevant disease condition. I mentioned earlier that when we undertook our initial studies to demonstrate proof of concept for this idea, we used rapamycins. But it became apparent to us that we wanted to treat patients from the earliest possible age. So using Huntington's disease as a paradigm, we would want to treat patients who are gene positive, but perhaps from the age of 18, 19, with the idea of actually delaying the onset of disease and buying them more years of healthy life. So we need to find drugs that we can give people for decades that are going to be well tolerated and safe. And, and to that end, we've undertaken a, a number of chemical screens um, and identified a, a number of lead molecules. And I'm just going to tell you about one set of molecules that we identified from a screen that we undertook with a library that was highly enriched in compounds that had been used in man previously. So these are FDA-approved drugs, and we are basically looking for novel uses for these drugs as autophagy upregulators. 
Um, and the, the, the drugs shown on the slide are all autophagy inducers. Um, they enhance the clearance of aggregate prone proteins like mutant Huntington or forms of alpha synuclein, and they mediate protection in cell, Drosophila, zebrafish, and mouse models of, of Huntington's disease. And um, this is a complicated slide um, because uh, this these drugs act on a pathway where there are connections between the key nodes, and I can talk you through that quickly. So some of the drugs act on these imidazoline receptors that decrease cyclic AMP, and this ends up inducing autophagy. Cyclic AMP blocks autophagy by activating this EPAC protein, which is a guanine nucleotide exchange factor for the small G protein called RAP2B, which in turn activates phospholipase C epsilon to produce too much IP3. IP3 blocks autophagy by a number of mechanisms, but one is by binding to receptors on the endoplasmic reticulum, releasing too much calcium, and the calcium we found activates calpanes, which is known to occur, but calpanes um, block autophagy by cleaving um, this GS protein um, to constitutively activate it and in turn form more cyclic AMP. Um, so we've got drugs acting on multiple nodes of this pathway, on the imidazoline receptor, on the L-type calcium channels, on inositol triphosphate metabolism, and um, approaches working on calpane. And we validated all of these um, in mouse models of disease. Um, one of these we've already taken through to a clinical safety trial, um, rulminidine, which acts on the imidazoline receptor, and this is just about complete and is being driven by um, Roger Barker in Cambridge, and my colleague uh, looking at early stage Huntington's disease patients. I just want to give you a flavor that autophagy is a protective strategy. It's not something that's confined to neurodegenerative disease. My good colleague, Vojo Deretic, um, showed that um, autophagy can enhance the clearance of mycobacteria, and he did his experiments um, in cell culture. So we wanted to see whether this was the case in vivo. And so what we did is we took all the drug hits from the previous slide, and we looked to see if they could enhance the cellular-based killing of mycobacteria. Um, the drugs themselves have no effect on mycobacteria viability in isolation, but they enhance the ability of cells to kill the mycobacteria. So these experiments are, are done in mouse macrophage cell line, and then we took um, some of these drugs further in, into primary human macrophages and human alveolar macrophages. And the drug we want to concentrate on is um, the anticonvulsant carbamazepine, where we found that it had efficacy at concentrations that were similar to those that would be seen in patients taking the drug. And therefore, we collaborated, and so this work is done with, in collaboration with Andres Floater and Dion Ordway, and Dion Ordway did the, um, the mycobacterial work in mice. And so what she did is she infected mice with multi-drug resistant mycobacteria, um, and the back shows the placebo-treated mice, the blue shows the mice treated with the conventional chemotherapy for tuberculosis, and it has no effect because these are drug resistant. But um, the carbamazepine has quite a dramatic effect, especially given in mind that there's a log scale on this axis. So um, we feel that um, we have uh, broadened the repertoire potentially of autophagy upregulating drugs um, to this class of diseases. And I think going to one of the points Martin made earlier, when I was a medical student in South Africa, I saw patients with cerebral tuberculosis. Um, so there's even a reach for these types of strategies into brain diseases. But rarely to veer outside the field. I'll tell you a quick vignette. One of these outstanding postdocs that's just left my lab is a man called Kevin Moreau, and I'll show you some of his work just now. And he had a brother who was doing his PhD in a lab working on Pacific oysters. So the two brothers were talking, and the upshot of the discussions led to a collaboration where we showed with his lab, um, Tristan Renault's lab, that autophagy upregulation, indeed carbamazepine, can protect oysters against both viral and bacterial toxins. So um, the reach of autophagy can even go into food um, production if you're interested in shellfish. So that brings me to my first conclusion, that autophagy enhancement might have benefits by reducing the loads of these poisonous proteins, which are aggregate prone, and various pathogens. 
We've also shown, and I can describe the mechanisms, that it reduces susceptibility to a range of pro-hepatotic insults. As I've shown you, we and now others have shown that um, autophagy upregulating strategies um, are protective in a range of cell and animal models of Huntington's disease and related conditions. And these benefits can be mediated by drugs acting on the target of rapamycin or by mTOR independent strategies like I showed you with the FDA approved drugs. With that in mind, we've made a big effort in the lab to try to understand as much as we can about autophagy signaling with the aim of identifying new therapeutic targets. And I don't have time today, and you're probably not interested, to go through all the detailed cell biology. But um, suffice it to say that the biology of the target of rapamycin is rather complex, and we've done quite a lot of work around it. And many of the genes that we've identified that regulate autophagy are involved in cancer. And um, so there's an additional um, component to autophagy that is outside my ma lab's main interest, but that is in the context of, of carcinogenesis. But it serves as a segue into telling you about um, our discovery of a non-canonical autophagy signaling pathway that I believe reveals a new therapeutic target um, for, for, um, for neurodegenerative diseases. So, Canonical autophagy signaling is driven by a, a lipid called phosphatidylinositol 3 phosphate. I'm just going to say PI3P so I don't get tongue tied. And this drives autophagy by recruiting a protein called WIPI2, which in turn recruits proteins like ADG16, which dictate the site of autophagosome formation on specific membranes. WIPI, WIPI, uh, PI3P is generated by a kinase called VPS34. And, and that is canonical autophagy. So VPS34 makes PI3P, which dictates the sites of autophagosome formation. But there have been papers in the literature suggesting that you can get VPS34 independent autophagy. So if you knock down or knock out VPS34, you can still have autophagy. And this has been observed particularly in cells that are glucose starved. So, one possibility is that there's a VPS34 independent source of PI3P, which there might well be. But what I'm going to tell you today is that VPS34 autophagy can, or PI3P dependent autophagy can be substituted by a different lipids. And that is the mirror image phosphatidylinositol called PI5P. And this is work that was driven predominantly by Mariela Vicinanza in the lab. So, the first set of blots show experiments where we've taken cells and loaded them with PI5P or the carrier lipid. Um, and so I, I don't know how well you can see the blots, but this band called LC32 correlates with the number of, or the, the volume of autophagosomes in the cell. And you can see that the volume goes up. This is a light and a dark exposure of the Western blot. It goes up very dramatically when you load with PI5P. If we want to measure the rate of autophagosome formation, we clamp their degradation by adding a lysomal inhibitor like baflomycin A1. So any changes in the autophagosome number reflect changes in formation. And you can see when we treat cells with baflomycin A1, BAF, you get an increase in the number of autophagosomes when you load with PI5P, suggesting that you're getting more autophagosome formation in that context. Um, if we assess using cytometric methods the number of autophagosomes, the number of autolysosomes in the cell, you can see that they go up in a dose-dependent fashion when we load the cells with PI5P. So the autophagosomes are in yellow, the autolysosomes are in red. So that's loading cells and that's an acute strategy. Um, but we wanted to understand the genes that regulate autophagy through this pathway. So PI5P sits here in the pathway. It can be synthesized from phosphatidylinositol by an enzyme called PIK5. And we used chemical inhibitors of this enzyme to show that it acts as one would expect in the pathway. Um, it can also be synthesized from PI35P2 um, by removing the the, 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 phos the, the phosphate at the three position by my tubularins, um, and we've shown that my tubularins play a role in this pathway as well. But the enzymes I want to focus on are called PI5P4 kinases, and it comes in three forms. There are three isoforms of these enzymes which all behave in the same way for us. 
So these enzymes change PI5P to PI45P2. And so they're basically metabolizing the PI5P. So if we knock down these enzymes genetically, we accumulate PI5P in the cells, we increase the number of um, autophagosomes, as we can see by the LC3, and we increase autophagosome formation, as you can see in the presence of the lysomal inhibitor, and similarly, one increases the number of autophagosomes and autolysosomes when one knocks down, knocks down these enzymes. I should point out, so I don't have time to show you, if we overexpress any of these enzymes, we get the converse effect. So, our idea was that PI5P is the mirror image phosphoinositide to PI3P, so we want to work out if they are functionally interchangeable. So what we did is we took cells and we looked at the effect of the VPS34 inhibitor wart manon on these cells, and as expected, um, it decreases PI3P and decreases the number of autophagosomes, in fact, the rate of autophagosome formation. And this can be rescued when you take the wart manon treated cells and you add back the PI5P. So this suggests a functional rescue. We confirmed these effects by using genetic strategies to increase the PI5P levels, for instance, by using knockdowns of the PI5P4, the PI5P4 kinase enzymes. We confirmed the autophagic data by electron microscopy, um, and we showed that the PI5P effects with wart manin were also seen if we used an alternative strategy by knocking down the VPS34 kinase. So we did a lot of experiments, which I've just shown you one, that suggests that PI5P can rescue the effects of PI3P depletion. So we did the converse. We showed that PI3P could rescue the effects of PI5P depletion. So how are they working? So I told you earlier that canonical autophagy works by PI3P binding to this protein called WIPI2, which then sequesters proteins that are important for dictating the site of autophagosome formation. So we use biophysical approaches to try to show that PI3P and PI5P could both bind and compete for binding for WIPI2. So what we did is we took cells and we transfected them with GFP tag WIPI2, and then we took beads that were either uncoated or coated with PI3P, PI5P, or PI, and looked to see if the beads could pull down the GFP tag with P2B. And here I show the pull down with the PI5P and the PI3P. In order to show that this effect was specific, we did the experiment with PI5P and showed that the effects of the PI5P coated beads could be competed out by incubating the mix with liposomes containing PI5P. Similarly, the effects of the PI3P beads could be competed out by liposomes containing the PI3P. But then, importantly, we showed that the effects of the PI5P could be competed out by, beads by liposomes with PI3P. So the PI3P and 5P compete, and similarly, the beads with PI3P can be competed out by beads containing PI5P. So, by physically, they can compete for binding to the same substrate. Finally, the domain for binding WIPI2 to PI3P is being inferred, and we mutated the domain and showed that this reduces binding to the PI3P beads, and it, bind, it reduces the bindings in a similar way to the PI5P beads. So, this gets me to a model. This is PI, this is PI3P, this is PI5P. They're mirror image phosphoinositides. And they both play similar roles regulating autophagy by being attached to key membranes, where they then recruit proteins like WIPI2, which in turn recruits ATG16, which dictates the sites of autophagosome formation. They're functionally interchangeable with normal autophagy and with um, starvation-induced autophagy, with full starvation-induced autophagy with amino acids. And as I've shown you, they are also functionally interchangeable in that the effects of PI3 depletion can be rescued by PI5P and vice versa. Interestingly, we showed that um, glucose starvation-induced autophagy is independent of PI3P, but dependent on PI5P. But this brings me to what I believe is the therapeutic twist. I haven't shown you, but we've done a lot of data to show that 
this enzyme system regulates the clearance of autophagic substrates like mutant Huntington. So here's just one bit of data. In wild-type mouse embryonic fibroblasts, if one knocks down one of the kinases regulating the PR5P levels and thereby increases PR5P, you um, clear the mutant Huntington more rapidly. If you overexpress the enzyme, you block the clearance and you accumulate the Huntington aggregates. But in, in autophagy-incompetent cells, these enzymes have no effect. So I believe this is a real new therapeutic target. It's potentially draggable, and we currently in the in the initial phases of a drug discovery exercise around these enzymes to try to identify novel inhibitors that are going to be useful. My lab's been very interested in, on the one hand, trying to find out how we can exploit autophagy to treat neurodegenerative diseases, but we've been also interested to see if autophagy is impaired in neurodegenerative diseases. And so th there are multiple examples that have been discovered, and these are just a few studies from our lab, where we've shown, for instance, that excess alpha-synuclein blocks autophagy both in cell-based models and in vivo, that there's a mutation that gives you Lephora disease, in a, uh, which is a degenerative epilepsy that blocks autophagy by increasing um, mTOR actively, so it works opposite to rapamycin, and nitric oxide excess, as you see in Alzheimer's disease, would similarly block autophagy. And these all act at the level of autophagosome formation. There are mutations in the dynin machine which traffic the autophagosomes to where the lysosomes are in the cell. And we've shown that um, they, if these mutations exist either in cells or in mouse models, they impair autophagosome degradation and aut uh, autophagic flux and increase the levels of aggregates in the various model systems. And so I think that it's quite possible that dynamic mutations or mutations in this machinery in forms of motor neuron disease or in Perry syndrome, which is a form of Parkinsonism, um, are impairing autophagy and this thereby contributes to the accumulation of the aggregate prone proteins and the toxicity. <clears throat> And finally, um, lysosomal storage disease is the most common um, neurodegenerative diseases of childhood, and um, indeed, um, defects in the lysosome might be very important contributor to forms of Parkinson's disease. Um, and in collaboration with Andrea Balabio's lab, we showed that these lead to defects of autophagosome or lysosome fusion. So now I just want to do a bit of a punt for basic cell biology because it, I think in our lab it's shown us in the last five years how understanding the basic biology can really illuminate disease. So one of the key questions in the field is to understand how autophagosomes are built. And it's likely that there's membrane trafficking and membrane coming from multiple sources that contribute to autophagosome biogenesis. So the work we've done has shown that one key protein called ATG16 um, resides in a given set of clathrin-coated pits on the plasma membrane and then traffics to the recycling endosome. And this trafficking event is critical for autophagosome formation. In addition, these vesicles undergo snare-dependent homotypic fusion events, which are also critical for the generation of autophagosomes. A distinct autophagy protein called ATG9 is found in separate clathrin-coated pits and is trafficked to recycling endosomes too, but through an independent route. This traffics through the classical route through early endosomes when it picks up a distinct set of snares to go to the recycling endosomes where it undergoes heterotypic fusion with the vesicles containing ATG9. And both the homotypic fusion and the heterotypic fusion events are critical for autophagosome biogenesis. This is a physiologically regulated. Um, um, and we found that increased in starvation conditions. Um, and very recently, we've shown one mechanism how this might occur. And I'm happy to elaborate it on it um, in the question time. So, um, there's an actin regulating protein that regulates actin polymerization called an exon A2 that we found regulated the traffic of the ATG9 vesicles from the early endosome to the recycling endosome. And um, Morozova and colleagues showed about the same time that this regulates, I mean, in their hands, the endocytosis 
of the ATG16 containing vesicles and their homotypic fusion. So the Synex and A2 protein works at distinct stages of this pathway I've described, and we've shown that it is upregulated through a JNK junk-mediated process after starvation, even in vivo in mouse brains. So why am I telling you all this stuff? So I'm going to give you two examples. There's a mutation in a, the retromer complex component called VPS35 that gives you an autosomal dominant form of Parkinson's disease. And in collaboration with Matt Siemens lab, we showed that this particular mutation affects the ability of the early endosomes to recruit the actin remodeling wash complex and thereby affects the trafficking of the ATG9 containing vesicles to the recycling endosomes with resultant impaired heterotypic fusion. So this particular trafficking event is impaired as a consequence of this mutation. And we've shown that the consequent decreased autophagosome formation results in the accumulation of alpha-synuclein in cell models um, with this mutation. The second example comes from a, a large collaborative study driven by Kevin and Moreau in my lab and Angie Fleming in my group who works on zebrafish models. And what we showed in this study is that this CALM locus, which is a well-validated Alzheimer's disease risk locus, affects a number of stages of the autophagy pathway. This protein affects the endocytosis of key snare proteins, and it affects the endocytosis of VAMP2, which impacts on the homotypic fusion of ABG16 molecules, VAMP3, which impacts the heterotypic fusion of ATG9 and ATG16 molecules, and these two affect the formation of autophagosomes. It also affects the endocytosis of AMP8, which affects the fusion of autophagosomes and, and lysosomes. So it affects both autophagosome formation and autophagosome lysosome fusion. And we've gone on to show in, in neurons, in Drosophila, and in zebrafish, that affecting this pathway through CARM, or which is also known as PICARM, affects tau toxicity and tau accumulation. So it provides a link, it's almost certainly not the only link, but a link between a GWAS hit, autophagy, and tau accumulation as a hallmark feature of Alzheimer's disease. So to end the sort of first, the major part of the talk, I want you to take home two messages. The first is that autophagy upregulation might be a viable therapeutic strategy for suitable neurodegenerative diseases um, by enhancing the clearance of these toxic aggregate-prone proteins by protecting against um, apoptotic insults. And this can be mediated through a range of targeting, a range of, 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 of signaling pathways. On the other hand, autophagy compromise might be an important pathogenic feature driving disease um, in certain conditions. The final story that I'll briefly tell you about has got nothing to do with autophagy, um, <clears throat> and it's a recent story, but we've been working for many years, which has been driven by Maria Jimenez Sanchez in my lab, she's Spanish, um, and it's the fruits of a really successful and, and fun collaboration we had with um, Sienna Biotech. And, and, and the story started with um, a genetic screen, so we developed cell lines that expressed full-length mutant Huntington, and these cells show some toxicity. And we um, then exposed the cells to what we call a druggable genome screen. So it's the genes in the genome that are potentially druggable, about 6,000 genes, and we knocked down each one in turn with siRNAs and did all the standard deconvolution type experiments one would do um, to try to um, ensure the effects were not due to off-target effects. And at the end of the day, we had about 200 genes that were validated targets showing an effect in the cell-based system. I didn't really believe the results, so I thought we needed to do a completely orthogonal validation. So we took a Drosophila model that we had in the lab that expresses mutant, in fact, just a fragment of Huntington, in fact, just the polyglutamine expansion, and we found the Drosophila orthologs of the hits. They're about 130 Drosophila orthologs were identified, and then we tested them with knockdown experiments in Drosophila. So if you express expanded polyglutamines in the Drosophila eye, you get these necrotic spots, and these are rescued by about half of these genes, which I thought was a pretty good hit rate. 
For the rest of the talk, I'm just going to focus on one of the hits called QPCT. I'll explain what QPCT is in the next slide. But we show that QPCT rescues like the other genes, and QPCT also decreases the number of aggregates formed by GFP tagged polyglutamine expansions in the eye. So this shows the, the aggregates formed by the GFP tag protein, and you can see they decrease by the QPCT knockdown. This also occurs, I mean, hex cells expressing um, exon 1 of mutant Huntington, as well as in primary neurons. So this shows the aggregation data with the knockdown and likewise in the, in the primary neurons. So what is this enzyme? QPCT is called glutaminyl cyclase, and it converts an internal glutamine or glutamate to a pyroglutamate. And this has received some attention in the context of Alzheimer's disease, where removal of the N-terminus of the AP reveals um, a, a, a glutamine, um, which, sorry, glutamate, which can then be pyoglutamated by this enzyme, and it's thought that this increases its hydrophobicity and aggregation potential. Um, and so we knew that it was possible to develop drugs against this enzyme, and so Sienna Biotech uh, did a silico screen to identify um, molecules that could potentially inhibit this enzyme. These were then tested in a biochemical assay, and then um, we tested the three hits that came through the system um, in, in cell-based and in vivo assays, and found that the drugs that inhibited um, this enzyme were protected in cells, primary neurons, Drosophila and zebrafish. So this shows um, some of the data, for instance, um, in, in the cells, on the neurons, you get protection with these three drugs, and the effects um, against aggregation, for instance, are dependent on the enzyme. So if you knock down the enzyme, there's no further protection with the drugs as opposed to the cells treated with the control shRNA. I don't know if you can see, here are some of our zebrafish data um, showing what happens when you treat the zebrafish model of Huntington's disease with this drug. So we generated zebrafish model of Huntington's disease that expresses um, exon 1 of Huntington in the rod photoreceptors. So this is the um, photo, this is the retina of the zebrafish, and you can see very clear aggregate formation by the GFP tag protein. And you can see the drug reduces the number of aggregates that are formed, and you, I'm sure you can't see it. But here we've stained the, the retina for rhodopsin. So these, the mutant Huntington's only expressed in the rods, so you can look at the number of remaining rods by doing a rhodopsin stain, and, and the rhodopsin staining is much improved by the drugs campaign, compared to um, the, the DMSO condition. So how does the QPCT modulate aggregation? It depends on its activity, because if you overexpress QPCT, you get more aggregation. If you express um, an inactive form of the enzyme, you have no effect. It affects many different aggregate-prone proteins, so it affects GFP-tagged uh, Q70. Q81, so it's a polyglutamine expansion, but it would also affect a polyalanine expansion. Um, and it appears to affect the oligomerization at the early stage of these proteins. So here's an experiment where Maria's overexpressed GFP tagged mutant Huntington fragments and um, flag tagged mutant Huntington fragments in immunoprecipitated. And if you treat with the drug, you get less immunoprecipitation, so less interaction of the soluble interacting protein. How does this work? It doesn't affect autophagy, it doesn't affect the proteasome, it doesn't affect the integrated stress response, it doesn't affect HSF activity, it doesn't express affect heat shock protein 70. We tried everything, we got desperate. When you get desperate, you do an array. And so we exposed um, a stress array, uh, cells, to, to this drug, and did a, a, looked at expression of proteins on a stress array, and the best hit was a chaperone called alpha-beta crystalline, which we were excited about because we knew that overexpression of this protein in other contexts could alleviate aggregation. Um, this is confirmation with the knockdown of the protein of QPCT in primary neurons, showing that um, the levels of, 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 of uh, uh, the, the alpha-beta crystalline go up, um, and here, the protein data showing that the levels of the alpha-beta crystalline go up either in naive cells or in cells expressing mutant Huntington when you knock down um, the, the, the QPCT. The effects of the QPCT on the aggregation look like they're largely dependent on the alpha-beta crystalline because this, again, is in naive cells where um, the drug 
um, decreases the aggregation. But if you're not, if you're, sorry, if you overexpress alpha beta crystalline, you reduce aggregation, but the drug has no further effect. So we left with the pathway where we have a druggable screen, genetics, we identify a drug, we identify the mediator, the primary mediator of the drug, um, and this looks like that QPCT is reducing the aggregation not of, only of mutant Huntington, but of a range of other proteins by modulating the levels of, of the small heat shock protein, alpha beta crystal. So I'd like to leave you on a more optimistic note. I think there are likely to be multiple protective routes that we can consider for these types of diseases. I've talked about two autophagy and small heat shock protein chaperones. Um, we certainly need to consider the possibility of synergy and interplay between these pathways, and these are areas we'll be looking at soon. Finally, this is work done by many people over many years. I've, I've mentioned the key players um, as I've gone along, but I just want to re-acknowledge some major collaborators we've had over the years. So Steve Brown in Harwell um, helped us with um, the, the, the motor neuron disease studies in mice and with some of the alpha synuclein studies in mice. Kihiro Kane has been our long-standing partner in crime doing Drosophila studies of these diseases. Andres Flota, I've mentioned the context of the tuberculosis work with Diane Ordway. Olaf recent tubing and very kindly gave us the spinocerebellae taxi type 3 mice before they were published. Roger Barker's in Cambridge has been collaborating us with the clinical studies. Paul Cudden made the zebrafish model in our group. Um, and Tristan Renault um, with the oyster study I mentioned. Um, Andre Caricasole was the main player to Sierra Biotech in the study I've just mentioned on the QPCT, and Andrea Balabio with the study on the lysomal storage diseases. And finally, I couldn't have done the work without the generous funding we've had over many years. Thank you very much.